Okay, hi everyone. This is me, I'm Sean Power, and I usually look like the guy in this picture, but I made the mistake in Toronto of going to a hipster barbershop for the first time a few days ago, and five minutes later, I ended up looking more like these guys. Um, so maybe I can join that group now. Um, my good friend Alistair Carolla actually grace, gracefully informed me on my Facebook feed that there's a word for this in Japanese called age ottori, which means to look worse after a haircut. <laughs> <clears throat> I've been involved in a number of startups over the years um, <clears throat> in many capacity, mostly on the product side, on the growth side. Some notable ones include Coradiant, PostRank, CoTweet, The Covetor, Acoha, but include many, many more. Um, I sit on the advisory boards of companies such as Onboardly, Kissmetrics, The New Hive. I'm a board member at Sampler and Dishcrawl, and I mentor the Google Next pre-accelerator in Toronto and Highline VC. And in general, I informally advise a lot of um, co-founders and founders through the act of listening and storytelling. Um, I'm a huge fan of tequila, and I try to visit the city as much as I can. Uh, I'm, my blood is Argentinian, and I live in the city of Toronto, which makes me a member of the few Argentinians in Canada. There are only 19,500 of, of us that live there. Um, I wrote the book Complete Web Monitoring, where we coined the term Lean Analytics, which later had a version two by the same name written by my co-author. I wrote parts of web operation and parts of designing with data, which comes out in July. <clears throat> and up until a few days ago, I thought that this talk was going to be a failure. I was going to come on stage and talk about how I even failed to make this talk happen. <laughs> I, could, I could have given you tons of excuse for this, but frankly, I was scared. A part of me wanted to be that guy to come up on stage and to throw around like analytics and business chops, and you, the audience, would hopefully think, this guy really knows his stuff, and I find that I have no choice but to buy him tequila and beer. And since I was involved in the company Cheeseburger, it's mandatory that I show animated GIFs to talk about how I feel. And this was me right about the moment where I received an email from Bala, I don't know where he is, um, <clears throat> where we were talking about what my presentation should be on. And expecting to talk about something about analytics and business, he dropped the bomb. I think a TED Talk drawing on your experience of success and failures is always good to hear. And so I felt like Jake, the dog, because I find talks about success pretty boring. They're kind of egotistical, and if they're not done right, they're kind of, they're, uh, sorry, they're kind of egotistical, and if they're not done right, and they're so much better in a you know, one-on-one -on -one setting, or at least in an intimate one. And so I could go through the stories of the books, the startups, the growths, the acquisitions, things are good, I'm the best, we're done. See, it's pretty boring, thank you. And so I'm Jake the dog because I knew that I need to find the guts to talk about things that I don't want to talk about. Because talking about failure, in my opinion, is so much more interesting, but so much harder. And not enough people talk about it. And so, like I said earlier, for the next 10 minutes, I get to talk to you about failure and how much I suck. Um, so let's dive in by talking about what failure is, what it's rooted in, and how it might pertain to startups. <clears throat> I wouldn't consider failure emotion. I'd consider failure a state, the state of Massachusetts, the state of failure, which is probably where I live. But what I've realized is that failure seems to be intrinsically tied to emotions. And so it's hard to talk about failure without using terms like happiness, sadness, shame, regret, and so on. Um, but weirdly enough, failure is like light. It's relative. In other words, based on where a person is standing, they may view an event as something different than the person who's traveling through it. And so here begins what I consider one of the most interesting disconnects about failure, which is that it's intensely personal and brings people through a journey that often others don't understand. It's tied to shitty emotions like shame and regret and sadness, and it's relative. And so I think that failure is defined as what happens when things that we want to go according to a plan in our life doesn't go according to that plan. So while you're sitting down with your best friend and they might ask you about your day and you say something like, eh, it was okay, but I thought that X was going to work out and it didn't, this might seem like the most tragic thing that has ever conspired in your life, but the other person might think, eh, that sounds really cool. And then you try to explain everything to the other person, it sounds stupid and petty, so you shut down because no one will understand your failure. So we've defined personal failure, but this is a business conference, right? 
And so it would make sense that you'd ask yourself why I'm even talking about personal shit in the first place. And I think that it's because many of us here consider our CV as part of the merit of our own lives. If I'm doing well in business, then maybe I'm doing well in life. At least I am a little bit. And if I'm not doing well in business, especially if it's my own, things kind of suck, which when you think about it, is really messed up because there are tons of external events that we can't control that tornado through our lives. And sometimes that triggers into aspects of our lives that don't have to do with our CV, like when we're with our partners, with our pets, our gardens, our ranches, our friends. So part of our personal happiness shouldn't be a checklist of partnerships and acquisitions, but I can't help but feel that it is for me. And so my personal failures affect my business life, and my business failures affect my personal life. I had a conversation about Maslow's hierarchy of needs with someone I care about a few days ago, and it reminded me that when we do feel like we're hitting rock bottom, just like J.K. Rowling said in her excellent commencement speech in, uh, to Harvard, um, hitting rock bottom because of failure is essentially a stripping down of the inessential. Our success and failures level us up and down in this pyramid. So we've defined failure, we understand why it sucks. To make matters worse, the insights from failure while we're experiencing one, while we're living in that state, are often not obvious. So it's storytelling time. One of the things that most people don't know about me is that when I was growing up, hip hop culture was a huge influence in my life. This is me in the middle, in the train underpasses of Montreal, with our graph crew called INP in the early, early 90s. Um, I think I'm 15 over here. Our creative outlet was spray paint on walls. I was never good at it, um, but through the scene, I created bonds that would give me lifelong friends. This is Pat Thompson, one of those friends. He used to write Evoke, E-V-O-K-E. -E. This is some of his art. He's renowned in the art community in North America for his use of paint on untraditional mediums. He's one of the founders of the Mistakeism movement, and is one of my favorite artists. Pat Thompson was pulled to the north of Canada as he was developing his artistic identity in the late 90s. Going to the north of Canada is really tough, and it's tough to talk about. Our northern population, they're called the Inuit people, is in peril. Last year showed us some of the most tragic stats seen in any people across the entire world. Suicide rates among Nunavut males aged 15 to 19 is estimated to exceed 800 per 100,000, compared to 14 for males outside of Nunavut. That's nearly a 1% suicide rate among teens. 27% of all deaths since 1999 have been suicides. This is one of the highest, most tragic numbers in the world. The rate of addiction is also heartbreaking. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, they're just rotting the communities up north from the inside. So as Pat put it to me over drinks literally last week, um, he hasn't met a child that's not been a victim of these afflictions in all the years that he's spent up north. So. What brought him up north for the first place is the point of this story. He received a grant to go and paint a mural in the heart of Cape Dorset. So that's Reykjavik up there. That's Cape Dorset over there. Um, so about the same parallel. His grant was around painting a large mural in front of the, in front of the Kikik Tani General Hospital. This is it right there. If your world that surrounds you is vast open lands and gray concrete, Pat reasoned that working with the community to bring a color could maybe help to begin to turn the tide of hope. And so let's do a little bit of mental exercise here. Imagine that you're in a subway car or a freight train or whatever. Imagine that you're in a train. Now, picture yourself walking in from one side of the train all the way to the other. Now do that nine times. So you're going from one train to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. Now look up. And imagine that there's a train above you. That's the scale of this mural. It was challenging for Pat because despite creating a work of art that honored the traditions and values of the people who lived in the community, it wasn't well received as he was doing it. 
I get that we're getting in uncomfortable territory, but this is a reality. Many women and men in the community up north are distrustful of white men in general, and Pat's white. And so we're the opposite of encouraging while Pat was doing his work. Some told him to leave the city, some would spin on the mural, some broke empty bottles near Pat and the others were working. Pat completed it, left shortly after and considered the project a failure. He hadn't understood that behind the mural were much larger socioeconomic and political challenges at play, and that who applied the color was just as important as what was represented by it. So three years later, Pat's walking around in Ottawa and notices a small man, no more than five foot one, at the corner of a street. He nods and says, hey, you're from the north, aren't you? And the man's surprised. He wondered how Pat knew. Pat explained that he spent some time in Cape Dorset, that he had inter interacted with members of the community, and that he had done a mural there. So the man was shocked, and without saying much more, asked Pat if he'd like to join him for drinks um, to meet some of his buddies. The drinks were at a strip club. Um, let's take a moment to acknowledge that this isn't Pat's kind of place, but bemused, he's like, fuck it, why not? And so with a five foot one man in tow, this is the inside, by the way, of the place in Ottawa, with a five foot one man in tow, he headed to this local strip club in downtown Ottawa. And in the middle of a club, sitting around this circular, kind of like this stage with a pole in it, um, were 13 short Inuit men. So Pat Shrug sat down, had a beer. And there are murmurs around the stage from the men. And he, over, he overheard one of them ask his host, the guy who had brought him there, why he had brought a kulinat to share drinks with them. Now, a kulinat is not a nice word, but it's one used to refer to a white man from the Inuit people. So Pat's sitting there, just quietly drinking his beer. And his host whispers something to his neighbor and a game of telephone begins around this stage um, as one man whispers a few phrases to the next. Now, this happens up and down the line a few times with no one addressing him. It's awkward. Um, finally, his host stands up, pats him on the shoulder, tells him to stay put, and the host goes and sits all the way across on the opposite side of the circle. So, that means that now there's an empty seat right next to Pat. And the person sitting next to the empty, empty seats moves to the seat besides Pat. He says to him, are you really the guy that painted the mural? Pat's like, yup. And the man tells him a small story about how much a mural means to him. And this begins to happen 13 times, each man taking about 10 minutes each in their own unique ways, how the mural impacted their lives. And as soon as I heard Pat tell me this part, this is when I knew that this was a story that we were gonna talk about today. One man said, my daughter killed herself a few years back. And I find that one of the faces that you painted reminds me of her. And so I like to go there every once in a while to remember her. And he just sat there in silence for like 10 minutes and then got up and gave the seat to, to his neighbor, who also went to share a story with him. All of this is happening while there's a person on stage doing whatever it is that they do. <laughs> so in that surreal moment, in a strip club in Ottawa, as a result of a complete chance encounter, Pat literally had a life-changing event. The lessons he learned during what he thought was a failure were merely lessons that he needed to learn at the time Things like being aware of politics, things like understanding, understanding how to work better with local communities. But what he learned is that failure is relative. And it's not only relative to the observers, but it's relative to time as well. Failure is a human state that is intrinsic to the experience of being human. Though it doesn't usually help to say things like that to a person who's in that state. It's important to remind our friends to go through it that they're not alone. So I have three final th thoughts on failure. Number one, help your friends and fellow entrepreneurs in the throes of failure by being there for them. Be aware of Maslow's hierarchy of needs as you're going through a failure yourself and try and stay leveled up as much as possible or help your friends level up again. Number two, 
recognize that imposter syndrome and being scared of failure is real and natural. Not talking about it is a mistake. And so here's me doing it. I'm going to do it right now. I get to announce for the first time today at Startup Iceland, and I've never announced this before, that Alistair Kroll, the guy who reminded me that my haircut is shit on my wall, um, and I have decided to work on a new, on a new startup. Um, we're really excited with the MVP. I think it solves the need we have. But truth is, is that I'm fucking terrified. I'm terrified. I'm terrified that I'll fail, especially after some of the successes that we have. I'm terrified of what people will think of me if I fail. I'm terrified that I'll never be asked to speak at a conference again if I fail. And so if me, after all these years in startups, still feel those feelings in even a worse way than my first, because my first, I had no fucking idea what I was doing. So I hope that you see through example that you're not alone and that I empathize with you if you have negative feelings around failure as well. Finally, number three, when making a talk about failure, be prepared for it to be really hard. This was, without a doubt, the hardest presentation I've had to do. So I'll be mentoring tomorrow. I'm looking forward to meeting many of you. Um, I highly also recommend booking some time with the Onboardly co-founders who are in the front here, who are really cool enough to join me in Iceland this week and are worth your time. Thank you so much.